evening and welcome to the Royal Opera House, both to the audience here in the Claw Studio upstairs, welcome to you, and to you worldwide watching our live stream via YouTube. I'm Kirsten O'Brien. For tonight's insight, we're going behind the scenes at the Royal Ballet as they prepare to perform their landmark production of The Sleeping Beauty. The director of the Royal Ballet, Kevin O'Hare, is here. Uh, talk me through what we're going to see tonight. Yes, well, we're going to talk about the evolution of the ballet, The Sleeping Beauty, and all the different productions that happened over the many years. We're going to talk with Monica Mason and Christopher Newton, who revived the classic Royal Ballet production 10 years ago, and how they came about to do that. And then Monica's going to coach um, Olivia Cowley, who's uh, making her debut this season in the very exciting role of Cara Boss. Of course, uh, Monica was famous for that role uh, when she used to dance it here. Uh, alongside her is Kristen McNally, who's already danced the role of Cara Boss, and so she will be there as well at this coaching session. And then we'll also have Samantha Rain, our ballet mistress, rehearsing Tierney Heap and Anna Rosa Sullivan in some of the fairy solos, which happen in the prologue. Lots of exciting stuff. I'm going to be grilling you as well. Just a warning Bye. that is going to be happening. Uh, let's have a sneak peek at The Sleeping Beauty now, though, which will be in cinemas around the world on February the 28th. Looks good, doesn't it? You want to go now, don't you? Well, to find your local cinema screening, you need to visit roh.org.uk slash cinema. And tweet us this evening, by the way. If you're on Twitter, we would love your thoughts, your questions. We'll read some of them out. It's hashtag rohbeauty. Now, I'm sure you all know the story of The Sleeping Beauty, but just in case you need a little refresher, we have Jenny Bavage here from the University of Cambridge who's going to talk us through it. The story of a lovely girl in an enchanted sleep is one which has been handed down by generations of storytellers. To construct his version of the story, Marius Pepit Petipa took elements from the fairy tale as it had been told by Charles Perrault in his The Sleeping Beauty in the Woods and the Brothers Grimm in their story Little Briar Rose. The ballet is structured around parties. King, King Forestan and the Queen are celebrating the birth of their daughter, Aurora. But the party is invaded by the appearance of the malevolent fairy, Carabos, who is furious at being uninvited, and instead of a present, bestows a terrible curse. The princess will prick her finger on a spindle and die. Fortunately, the lilac fairy has still to give her gift, and she changes the sentence of death to a century of sleep, to be broken by the arrival of a prince. The second act brings us to the day of Aurora's 16th birthday. An old woman presents Aurora with a forbidden spindle. Aurora disregards the warnings of those around her and plays delightedly with it until the curse does its work and she falls insensible to the floor. The disguised Carabos reveals herself, triumphs and disappears. But the lilac fairy is there to make good on her promise. Aurora begins her 100 years of slumber and the enchanted sleep descends on the court. Deep in the forest, which has grown around Aurora's palace, Prince Florimond, dissatisfied with his buttoned up love interest and bored of the games played by his hunting party, is drawn into Aurora's story by the Lilac Fairy. Enraptured by his vision of the princess, the prince follows the Lilac Fairy to the gates of the palace. Carabas has one last go at ruining everything but the prince eventually finds Aurora, bestows the kiss, and everyone wakes to joy and reconciliation. The final act revels in wide-awake pleasures, 
Characters from all over the fairy tale world, including Red Riding Hood and slightly weirdly Bluebeard, tumble together alongside fairies and the rejoicing court. So this is a tale about gifts and hospitality, promises and curses, magical and human transformations. And now let's see how dancers of the Royal Ballet transform into the evil Carabos. I'll pass you over to Monica Mason, who knows a thing or two about the role. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So I'm really pleased to be able to show you what happens when somebody new learns this role. And Olivia and I have not rehearsed at all. Uh, I think Kristen's probably been going through it a little bit with her. But it's really not easy to learn to use your arms, your hands, and the weight of your body quite differently from the way you would use it when you're a dancer. And it takes a little while. I'm going to be very honest with Olivia in, in order to try to help her as quickly as possible because, of course, we've never got miles and miles of time in, in anything for any ballet. So let's have a go. Paul Stobart's on the piano, so Paul knows where we're beginning. So Carabos has come in in her wonderful carriage. They've made a circle around the stage, drawn by the rats, and they finish centre stage. Yes, so thank you, Paul. Kristen, you. Thank you, thank you. Well, you remember it. You remember everything. <laughs> Very good. Um, you take this now okay. and you have a go. Oh, goodness. Yes, <clears throat> straight off into the deep end. So you're going to arrive in your coach and your center stage. So you're going to get out on that first phrase. You step out. Now you start to walk forward. You've got the whole phrase. Da -dee, da -dee, da -dee, da -dee, da -dee, da -dee. No. Yes, look at the Queen, yeah, and, and you bow. Oh. So on the last part of the phrase, you curtsy, yes, and you say, you forgot me, why? Okay, now, it wants to be much bigger, much stronger, Olivia, okay? You, yes, you, and you're looking right at her, there's the Queen, you, Forgot. Now, if, if possible, the Queen is slightly downstage, because the worst thing is to have to mime upstage and then the audience can't see you. <coughs> so you're going to look right at her. You. Do I, do I stay <coughs> my legs? You've curtsied like that. You. You forgot. Now, you're doing forgot so the audience can't see it. So you have to do you forgot. Yes, forgot. Me. And me is so important. Me. How is that possible? Why? Yes, that's right. And don't be afraid of really finishing it off. Like you do with your feet, so you do with your hand. So the end of the fingers, end of the gesture really shows. Yes? And also don't bend at all like that. You forgot me. Why? Yes, right? She says, oh, I. No, it wasn't me at all. It's my husband. <laughs> and the <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> her husband says, me, me, no, I'm not responsible at all. It's Catalibut. And, and so, Catalibut, <gasps> he's like this, so you call him. Yeah, and 
here. Yes, make no mistake, here and now, I mean. Yes, so he comes in, and the first thing you take off is his hat, and then you take, yes, and the, and the wig, yes. Now, delicious, you're going to pull the hairs out of his head. So this particular, and you give them to the rats. Each time you pull, try not again, soon, yeah, audience will lose you. So try and keep it, yes, there we go, there we go, there we go. We go, yeah, yeah, now, now, delight. I'm going to really beat you with the stick. Yeah, how, how do you do that? <coughs> <laughs> I've always wondered well, uh, that. Well, you, well, you have to pretend, various. well, you have to pretend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're stabbing at him. You stab at him. And then you're just about to hit him and you decide, no, I won't. I'll give it away. Yeah? She's super, super mean. Okay, so let's just have a go with the music. Now, it's not going to all happen at once, don't, don't worry. Same p music, please, Paul. Got me. Why? <gasps> Hat. Not behind you. They'll be right there. That's it. Now. One of the rats takes it from you. That's it. Good. You're fine. You're fine. No, no, no. No, it's absolutely fine. Remember, one of the blissful things about doing mime is that providing something's going on in your head, you can be absolutely still and just think it. And it's, it should still be riveting. You know, it's so much easier than standing on point and trying to be still. <laughs> so, so, you know, you're really, even there, if you, shall I hit you? Maybe I won't. Take it. You know, something, you can, and you can always invent it. All right, pretty good. Okay, so now, just going on for now. So now I'm going to be, I think I'll be a fairy. You, you can concentrate on Carabos. So the fairies come around. <clears throat> so Carabos, the fairies are up here by the cradle. Yes. And the fairies come all the way around her. And she thinks how silly they all are. And so they say, mm, please, you, yes, that baby there, you're so angry with, please don't be angry. So the first one is to this fairy. Oh, your singing would drive me mad. Bush. And you, with all your elegance and grace. Ah, the fairies, that's right. That's it. And we'll cut, that's where we'll make a cut. And then we'll go, we'll do rats when we've got all the rats. Because there's so many other people involved in the scene and we can't be all of them for you. <laughs> so, uh, Okay. But again, that's one of those moments because you, you're stood in the centre for such a long time with nothing, nothing. to do. So, you, so like just, you just, you just keep, keep your brain going. <laughs> keep being so furious and everything, so evil, mean. Yeah, so we've, you've just given this here. So, Paul, just where we stopped, please.
Okay. All right. Lovely. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> it's like she kind of likes the attention that they're all kind of asking. Oh, she loves all yeah, that. Yes, so of course. Might, yes, because from the moment smile. she came in, you see, she wants mm. to actually show them her power mm. and how... And they're terrified of her because she is clearly going to make a curse. Mm. And they don't know what it is. She's so unpredictable. Mm. So you're just there, just where we were once again, the same place, Paul, please. <clears throat> so you see them coming around. That's all right, okay, all right. So, so she'd use that arm. Uh, mm, mm, yes, that arm, that arm. So that you can, yeah, and all the time keep making eye contact because the fairies are here, absolutely terrified. <coughs> You've been a fairy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you. And that, now, it's you. Now, what am I going to say to you? You, what drives me really, what really irritates me about you? You, that singing, that delicious voice, you know, because that's, that fairy is giving Aurora a beautiful singing voice. Yes, it's not a beautiful singing voice. Yes, yeah, and, and, and this, yeah, yes, get out of my way. Don't even bother me, don't concern. And, and then, who's next? This one, yeah, you. Yet. Now, mind you, don't feel you have to lunge. Yeah, you can just step. Yes, y yes. Now, try and also, Olivia, try not to say the word. No. Try not to say you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and remember also, from the audience, from the theatre point of view, you want everybody to see that gesture, and everybody to see that gesture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but now be careful that it doesn't look like waves. You're really saying such elegance. So this hand goes down the arm like that, and this one stays still. Otherwise, we get waves. Yes, and you don't want waves. Yes. And also a little softer so that your hand is going across your arm like that, not not hard, you see? Not a hard hand. Yeah. It's so important to show, to show the hand and your fingers. Yeah? Let's do it once more, that place. <clears throat> Thank you, Sam, Paul. at all. Not bad at all. There'll be lots more things for me to say and I won't do that. I want to try and get on to the next bit. So we've done ratties and, and they've gone round us and we're in the middle and the rats have been dancing all the way and you tell them to stop. Now you come forward again. Dee dum, dee dum, dee. Your Majesty. Yes, Your Majesty. No, you can if you feel like it. Sometimes we've done a bit of that. She's, be, she's being very... Um, Ninette de Valois, when she first taught 
us all of this one. She did a little bit. It was just like the slightest, and it, she said, it's, she's very sarcastic. She doesn't mean the bow <laughs> at all. Yes, so, but she has to do it because it's the queen. So she's, yeah, and then now she says, you, you listen. Now, not think, listen, literally on your ears, on that little bit. That, yes, ta-ta. Listen to me, speak. Yeah, yes. Now, you want, the most important thing is not the walking, but the actual saying. Yeah, and, and it's like, it's almost as if you pull the words out of your mouth with your finger. Yeah? Yes, and not too high. It's out here. It's as if you're having a conversation with somebody, so it's at, to the other person. So it's that height. Yes, that's right. Yeah? You hear what I'm going to say. You hear me speak. Yes, that baby is going to grow. She's little. She grows and she grows and she's beautiful and she's graceful and elegant. But, yeah, make eye contact with the queen constantly during that conversation so it doesn't just become your little dance, yeah? Uh, Kristen, why don't you go first on that, please, darling? So, Paul, just where we were? Yeah. Good, Kristen, thank you. Have a go. <laughs> Big and brave. <clears throat> so, you're sort of more centre stage here, Olivia. Don't go so far back. And the ratties have been going all the way around you. So let's hear that again, please, Paul. Stop. Come, walk down. See her? Curtsy. You. Here. Me speak your beautiful baby over there. She's little, she grows up. Yes, yes, she's beautiful and elegant. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah, really not bad at all for the first time. Try not to walk toes first. You're actually, yeah, you're in the right shoes and, and just feel your weight a little bit more so that you just, you walk, literally walk, yes. It doesn't have to be heavy, you know, don't overemphasize it, but don't feel that you're a, exactly, that's exactly right, yes. And your skirt is long, you know, we don't really see, yeah, okay. So that gives you some idea. Yeah. At the very end, death. Yeah? Not here. Okay. Yeah? Again, the audience. Yeah? Yes? Oh. Mm -hmm. Now you start to laugh. Yes. And, and of course, it's, it wants to start. <laughs> and you look at them. 
because then they come in front of you and they're begging you and everything. So you, you just, I've got them exactly where I want them, right in the palm of my hand. Absolutely. Good, so we're going to have lots of fun when we have a little bit more time. Yeah? Thank you very much, yeah. girls. Thank you. Thank you. Come and join me. Mm -hmm. I give that to you, ladies. I'm going to start now, actually, with you. <laughs> How was that? How was the pressure there of doing that? It, it's amazing to have Monica Mason to, to coach you. It's, it's just incredible. So I'm really excited now to get back into the studio like on Thursday and, and start rehearsing again, yes. And Kristen, have you danced the role before? Yes, so I've done it a few times before. And I, I think the thing I love about it is it's so far removed from who we are. You know, it's in a fairy tale that the build up is really nice before uh, your show because it takes such a long time to get ready. The makeup is amazing. So you're sat in makeup for an hour, then you have this amazing wig. And slowly as you're sat there and you're thinking, you start to start thinking like Caragross and create this realm that you belong in and it's it's, I was say, it's really you're standing amazing here both yeah. so smiley yeah. but does it help to maybe like, be in a so bad it's mood it's fantastic but you feel yourself <laughs> be becoming this evil person as you're slowly getting ready and it's it, it's great to do and sit there start ordering people yes. around before you go and say, now I'm really angry. <laughs> How important, Monica, is the language of it? You were doing a lot of work on the language of it there and expressing that. Yes, well, that's what we, how we were taught it. And, and one, of the, one of the most difficult things about learning to mime is that you have to try to think the word before you make the gesture so that you don't, you aren't thinking and doing the gesture at the same time. You think the thought and make the gesture. And in fact, it's really rather like natural speech anyway. You know, when you're having a conversation with someone, especially if you're a bit angry with someone, you know, you're controlling your anger. And then you're saying, you know, you, it's in your eyes before it comes out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes terrible things come out of your mouth. <laughs> I was going to say, you've got to remember not to speak as well. You were pointing that out. <laughs> Don't actually. No, no. Uh, so you, a family member of yours recently saw you, didn't they? Uh, a video of you doing Carabos. How was that? I have two great nieces and uh, one of them said to, uh, to me the other day, you know how children love to be frightened? And one of them said, oh, Auntie Mon, please do your Carabos face. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And, she, and of course they both went, Ooh! I'm going to chat more to you later on, but I want to speak a little bit more to you. How challenging is the role in terms of other roles you maybe get to play? Oh, it, it, it's so difficult because, like Monica said, you, you want to do more, but you have to stop yourself because actually the less you do and the more in control you are of the role, then, you know, the more powerful it looks and the better it looks for something like this. Absolutely. Like, I do fairies, which is completely on the other spectrum of, of roles. Um, so it's really exciting to get my teeth into something like this. Yeah, I'm very excited. And where does it figure for you as a role? Yeah, the same. You find that each year that you revisit it, it, it starts to become slightly easier. It takes a while to, to, to learn how to do this because we're not, you know, when we go through classical ballet school the emphasis is on the dance training so suddenly to try and learn how to project and get the same emotion and message across without the steps is a challenge so it, it, it takes time so still it, it, where you know, would you say you are in the rehearsal process at the minute well, this is our first one it says you're, it, yeah. oh, so it's a bit rusty from well that was the first, first, right, wasn't it? Round, for the first one round of applause <laughs> please for Kristen for Olivia and for Monica thank you very much thank you, very thank much. you. Thank you. <laughs> wonderful stuff first performance Goodness me. Uh, well, remember, we do want to hear from you this evening as well. If you are on Twitter, I'd love a tweet from me. Your thoughts, your questions, perhaps, for what we've got coming up. It's hashtag ROH Beauty. Now, the story of Sleeping Beauty featured in the Royal Ballet's production is just one of the many versions of this classic. And to tell us more about the history of this tale, please welcome back Jenny Bavage. Petipa's version of the Sleeping Beauty creates spaces for the spectacle, pageantry and performance which a grand ballet requires. But the old fairy tale themes survive within it. The dancers tell us a story about human as well as, a, as well on a human as well as a supernatural scale, featuring human mistakes and virtues as well as magical curses and cures. 
As I mentioned earlier, the plot of the ballet emerges from the versions of the tale published and popularised by Charles Perrault in the 17th century and then the Brothers Grimm in the 19th. But the idea of a heroine awoken from enchanted sleep is much older. It appears in the story of Brynhild in the Icelandic Volsung saga. As retold in operatic form by Wagner in the Ring Cycle, Siegfried fights his way through dragons and fire and cutting away the armour of a mysterious sleeping figure discovers Brunhilde and awakes her with a kiss. This is Arthur Rackham's illustration of that moment. A very different story in mood, tone and setting appears in the Arabian Nights. Scheherazade recounts the ninth captain's tale in which a girl called Situkan is felled by a scrap of, of flax lodged underneath her fingernail and sleeps until awoken by her prince. Perrault borrows a suspicion of spindles and flax and old women for his tale. Carabos is, of course, a more, more glamorous incarnation of those fearsome witches and stepmothers of European fairy tales with their ability to turn household objects brooms, spinning wheels, apples, to vengeful purpose against the young and the beautiful. Details and plot points from Europe European tales also survive in other ways in the Perrault version. A 16th century French romance titled Perseforest includes the story of a fairy guest at a christening feast who curses the baby because she thinks the other fairies have been given fancier cutlery than her. Flax appears here too as the material which transmits the curse to the heroine Zelendine. In this tale, Troilus, the prince character, is not the chaste hero that we meet in the ballet. Another tale, Sun, Moon and Talia, included by Giambattista Basile in his 1634 Tale of Tales, also features a rather bawdier version of the initial encounter between prince and princess. The prince, he's actually a king in this version, is already married when he discovers the sleeping Talia. Basile attempts to describe this scene in poetic terms, saying that the prince is overcome with desire and so gathers the first fruits of love. Folklore scholars Iona and Peter Opie put it more starkly. He rapes her, leaves her and forgets her. In this version of the story, Talia is woken not by the chaste kiss of the prince, but by one of her twin babies sucking the flax from her finger. Talia eventually finds the king, but his wife has the heart of Medea and attempts to murder the children with the aim of feeding them to her errant husband. Talia narrowly avoids being burned alive before the queen is done away with and a happy ending is achieved, if you think it's a happy ending that she ends up with him. In Perrault's telling, the prince behaves himself rather better and the princess wakes just as he arrives, although there is no kiss. She greets him. Is it you, dear prince, she said. You have been long in coming. <coughs> they marry and he takes her home to his kingdom. But there is another wicked queen waiting and this time is the princess's mother-in-law, who is an ogress to boot. She tries to eat up the children herself. And these are the children are called Dawn and Day, and then she decides she's going to eat the princess and specifies that she would like to serve in a piquant sauce. When that plan is foiled, she tries to off them by throwing them into a tub full of vipers and toads with snakes and serpents of every kind. The prince arrives back just in time to interrupt this terrible scene, and the wicked ogress throws herself into the tub instead, where she's devoured by the terrible creatures. When the Brothers Grimm came to record their version of the story in their 1812 children's and household tales, they tell a story which dispenses with this gruesome stuff, getting rid of cannibal ogres and tubs of toads. This is the Walter Crane illustration for an 1882 translation. You can see it looks a little more wholesome. The Grimm's Briar Rose brings back the Siegfried-style kiss as the moment of awakening. And the Grimm's also allow the king and queen to sleep and wake with their daughter. The princess in Perrault's tale doesn't give her poor parents a second thought. When she falls asleep, he tells us, following the outline of the earlier tale, the king and queen kiss their dear child without waking her 
and left the castle. And they never see her again. We hear no more about them. Like the ballet, most tellings after the Grimm's choose this kinder version of the story, where everyone is restored to each other and all is harmonious. But perhaps one of the hidden threads in this tale is about the pain and the pleasure of parenthood. You can try to keep your precious one within your castle walls, and you can burn every spindle in the kingdom, but eventually she will grow up, and you cannot protect her from her own mistake or the influences of others. Scholars of the fairy tale have found other meanings within it. Perhaps the deep structures of the story speak to Freudian readings. Beauty's encounter with a spindle could signify the onset of menstruation or figure an awakening of sexuality. In his book, The Uses of Enchantment, The Meaning and Importance of Fairy Tales, Bruno Bettelheim talks of beauty's sleep as the waiting period of adolescence before sexual maturity. Marina Warner thinks of the story as being akin to the older, younger woman's struggles dramatised in fairy tales such as Snow White, Rapunzel and Cinderella. This is Arthur Rackham's version of that fearful older woman character, the, the Queen. Writers from Tennyson and Christina Rossetti to Anne Sexton and Robert Coover in the 20th century have given us their own versions of the story and there are countless revisions of Sleeping Beauty. She has appeared in space. She's awoken from a chemically induced coma uh, into a post-apocalyptic wasteland. In different versions, the prince has arrived to find a vampire, a corpse, a snoring trollop, or has decided not to wake beauty at all, preferring to let her dream on rather than wake to the realities of life. In the same spirit of textual poaching, the ballet cuts through the thickets of old versions and gives us a joyful telling of the story with a naughtier and more vital princess than the character created by Disney for the 1959 film, but with the gruesome elements of the earlier tales left out. The ballet expresses faith in true love, successful quests and great parties where all the right people are invited. Petipa borrows the name Aurora, Dawn, from Perrault's tale and in doing so prompts us to think of the story in terms of rebirth and the return of light. And of course, its revival in 1946 in this very wonderful theatre chimed with a sense of Britain's post-war recovery and reawakening, hopeful new beginnings. The ballet also has something to add to what a modern audience might feel is the problem of Sleeping Beauty's passivity as a heroine. Brunhilde slept because she refused to marry Odin's choice of husband, or he refused to marry when he said she should, uh, saying she would only marry a man who had proved his courage, so he stabs her with his thorn of sleep. But in most of the written versions, the Sleeping Beauty doesn't get to do much, even by the standards of fairy tale heroines. Perrault was careful to have the fairies give his princess gifts of skill and character, as well as beauty. She was to be graceful, spirited, to be able to sing like a bird and, of course, dance to perfection. The ballet retains this feature. Aurora is gifted with beauty, but also generosity, musicality, vivality. The lilac fairy may have given her wisdom, but has to give her life instead. So wisdom has to be one in the story of the ballet. And perhaps this is a function of the wonderful vision sequence. For the ballet production, this is a pragmatic addition. It means we get an extra pas de deux and the principal dancer doesn't have to sit out most of the second act. But it also means that Aurora is able to exercise her gifts of sincerity and grace and passion rather than just dozy patience and to take some part in the choosing of her prince. So the sleeping girl has had many names. Brunhilde, Situkan, Zeladine, Talia, Briar Rose, Aurora and has evolved as each new version has come into view. And of course, with every new production and with every new dancer who interprets the role, a new Aurora comes into being. Aurora is gifted with new gestures and a new personality by every ballerina who dances her. Last night, the 21st of November, marked 95 years since the first performance of the ballet in London. But now let's come back to the present day and hear more about the present production. Thank you. 
Please welcome back now Monica Mason, Kevin O'Hare, along with Christopher Newton, who worked with Monica on the current production of this ballet. So, Kevin, so many performances of this at the Royal Opera House over the years. Why is this one so important, do you think? Well, I think uh, it was very important to bring The Sleeping Beauty back this year because it is 70 years since uh, that first performance in 1946. Uh, the reopening of the Opera House, and it was such an occasion and such a sort of uh, triumph for Nanette de Valois at that time to bring this company that was really not that old and to present this ballet um, at the Opera House in the newly opened Opera House. 1946 wasn't the first performance, though, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't, and uh, I have to say, I didn't really know. We all think about 1946 as, as, as the moment, but there was a production. Her, uh, Dame Lynette and uh, Lillian Bayliss were very keen to do uh, The Sleeping Beauty for years before, and they talked about it um, in uh, sort of 1937, 1938, and uh, the stage of those of us who remember the old Sadler's Wells stage was very small. Mall. nothing like the Mariinsky <laughs> or anything like that um, and they did actually manage to make it a little bit bigger so by 1939 in February 1939 there was a, a production of they called it the sleeping princess at the time and it's interesting reading about it and little anecdotes like the Queen Mary came to the first performance and a young girl gave flowers to um, the Queen and she was called Beryl Gree uh, I think uh, cream groom and she became Beryl Gray who then later on became one of the famous uh, lilac fairies of her time and then uh, and the production was designed by the niece of Benoit and uh, I think Madame felt, Damien de Valois felt that she wanted to get away with the, from the heavy costumes of Basque, from the, from the Diagolef production. And so it was all very light and very thin costumes. They didn't have so much money at the time. And it was all greys and browns. And supposedly when uh, Margaret Fontaine put her costume on, she cried. <laughs> <laughs> and not because she was happy, I think. <laughs> and uh, so there was lots of things, but the actual production was a success, and already people could see that it was considered really the performance of the career of the young Margot Fontaine at the time, already a milestone in that career. So I think already it was showing signs that this could be a ballet that is, would be important to the Royal Ballet. Monica, you danced it in 1960, isn't mm. that right? How, how, what yes. memories do you have of that? Well, I, I mean, I was dancing in that Messel production because, of course, it stayed in the repertoire for many, many years. And uh, I'd never seen the ballet from the audience. So uh, for years and years, I danced in The Sleeping Beauty, never having seen it. And um, so, of course, the treat of one day going out front to watch the ballet was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and Christopher, you danced The Sleeping Beauty in 1953. What are your memories? <laughs> Well, unlike Monica, it, it, was the, it was the first ballet that I saw in the Royal Opera House was this production, uh, the 1946 production. Right. And I saw uh, Fontaine, partnered by Robert Helpman. And in that performance, Robert Helpman also did Carabos. So he had a dual role, because Carabos, in that original production, uh, finally vanished at the end of Act One. Uh, so he was able to uh, then become the prince for Act Two. <laughs> Is that one of the changes you've made in this production? No, I'm afraid not, no. <laughs> no, we now carry on Carabas right through to the end of the, of, uh, the awakening scene, yeah. Monica, you revived it in 2006, yes. is that right? Yes, yes. with Christopher. What, what did you do with it then? Well, what we wanted to do, really, there'd been a previous production and um, uh, I felt that we wanted to go back because, again, we wanted to celebrate 60 years in 2006. And uh, so it was, a, it was a wonderful opportunity to um, explore that 1946 production. And we, we spent hours and hours and hours going through old designs, old costumes, and there was a huge amount of research that went into it. But of course, we also wanted to update it. You know, we didn't want it to look exactly like 1946. And already, dancers danced differently. Um, and of course, now dancers are dancing differently, even in the last 10 years. I think a lot of the company who will be dancing in this production will have done lots of 
quite contemporary works. Um, and so it changes all the time. I think it, you, although we go back to our foundations, it also has to live in the time you're doing it. And I think, of course, when it was first created in 1888, I think, you know, it was, it must have been a revelation for the audience then because it also showed the company there at the Mariinsky Theatre in Russia how good the dancers were. It's quite interesting uh, thinking about the 46 performance and it was post-war and times of austerity and then you sort of think of where we are now. It's almost quite fitting in a way, isn't it, to, to have the performance? I think it's very different. <laughs> <laughs> I think our austerity now is nothing compared with what it was then. I mean, the story was that people in the audience who wanted to see the ballet gave their clothes coupons to Dame Ninette. And, uh, and so they used all their coupons to try to buy fabric. And the story, of course, on the first night in 1946 was that there was this tremendous smell of mothballs around the theatre <laughs> because everybody put all their finery away for the war and they brought it out afterwards. When you're coming back to it, Christopher, do you have to pour over old photographs, you know, go back in your mind, or is it just all there and you can remember everything? Well, I watched so many performances of it as a young student and as a, a you know, new member of the company. Um, things get sort of ingrained in my brain, you know. <laughs> I get a, I, I've got a mental picture of everything and uh, it, it uh, serves me greatly as to remember. Uh, so could you do the steps, for instance? Oh, yes. Really? Yes. Oh, yes. Still remember yes. it all? Well, He's got I can't a great memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you the same, then? Um, to an extent, but what always amazes me with Christopher, he, because I tend to remember what the girls did, but not the men. He remembers everybody. <laughs> <laughs> You're the yes, perfect it's, understudy. It's, it's sort of like a photographic memory in a way. Really? Yes. Sure now, the costumes was one of the things about the 46 performance, wasn't it? Just talk me through the importance of those the, costumes. Uh, well, the, 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 the actual designs, when we came to... Uh, to uh, recreate it this time, we, like Monica said, we had to sort of update it because I think um, there might have been something of a revolution in the company if uh, a lot of, especially the men's costumes, uh, were, were uh, uh, authentic to the original designs. Um, they were very, very elaborate and very overly decorated, so we simplified them quite a lot. OK, well, uh, the Royal Opera House collection holds many of the costumes from the Sleeping Beauty. And Laura Brown is the archivist in the Royal Opera House collections team. What have you got there? So Looking beautiful. What we have here are two iconic pieces from the historic costume collection, both of which are from the Royal Ballet's 1946 production of The Sleeping Beauty. So what we have here, firstly, is the tutu worn by Monica Mason, in 1964 as the fairy of the enchanted garden so you can see it's exquisitely decorated with the flowers on the sleeves and the leaves here and the bodice is hand painted which is a beautiful touch and here we have one of the headdresses worn by margot fontaine in 1946 as princess aurora in the vision scene you can see it's very delicately decorated with the crown clearly visible on top, you know, which indicates very clearly that she was the princess. Beautiful. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Laura. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, no tears, Monica, when you had to put that on? No tears at <laughs> all. <laughs> Absolute delight. <laughs> Kevin, why do you think that the Sleeping Beauty remains so important to the Royal Ballet? Well, it, it, it has always been, uh, you know, there at these major uh, moments in the history of the company. So, for instance, moving to the Royal Opera House in 1946. And then when the company went to America, it was the ballet that they first performed there. And that's where, you know, uh, sort of their international reputation was made as well. So it's always felt like it's, it's something of a signature ballet for the company. And uh, I think, really, it's such a huge huge ballet and so many wonderful roles. Uh, we saw Monica rehearsing Carabos, which is a fantastic character role. But then, of course, you have all those fairy solos, all those different characters, and, of course, the really the challenge of being Princess Aurora. Is it a really demanding 
ballet then for everybody. Yes, across the board, and that's what's wonderful about it, isn't it? Because yes. there's, it's, it is a demanding role for Aurora, but it's also demanding you have things like the Bluebirds, even the Corps de Ballet, you know, you have the, the, the nymph scene, you have the Lilac Fairy Attendants, the Friends. I mean, it's, it's endless. It is endless. It tests the strength of the company yes, yeah. really right through. The whole company. The whole company. And it's been said that the Sleeping Beauty is almost a works in progress. Do you, is that fair to say, that it's sort of constantly evolving? I think it has to. I think each time it comes back into the repertoire, you measure yourself. If you're dancing in The Sleeping Beauty, how good am I, really, classically? And that's the way you measure yourself. And I think, from Kevin's point of view, it's probably also how he would measure his company. He'd actually look at the company and think, are we as good as I'd like to think we are in the classics? Because they are, they are really so difficult because you can't hide behind anything. You have to show everything the way you were taught it by the book. So people seeing the performance on the 28th of February, what, what will they see? What will they see in this performance? I hope they'll see glorious dancers dancing gloriously. <laughs> to, a most, to the most um, wonderful, wonderful music. I mean, I, th I have to say the music is such a, a huge part of it. And, uh, of course, like Monica and Christopher, I've lived with Sleeping Beauty all my life, you know. It was, it was the first ballet, the, the Dame Lynette production in 1976 when I joined White Lodge and so we all came from White Lodge to see that before its premiere and then all the way through it's always been around in my dancing career and and on the other side and but still when I hear that overture I get excited it's yeah. something about it it makes me feel something great is going to happen and I hope for sure on the 28th and before that something great will happen and I think it's important for us because uh, as Monica says it does set out how the company is and I felt last year when we did Giselle the company were really looking at the top of their game in that particular which is a, a classic ballet of a different style a romantic more romantic style so I thought it was really important for this new generation of dancers that we have now in the company for them to to really take Sleeping Beauty to their hearts and and create glorious dancing as Monica said. And it's also I think each time Sleeping Beauty comes back you've got people who are dancing in it for the first time Yes. I mean, although with somebody like uh, Kristen, who's done Carabos before and has been in the company a number of years, she's done many roles, but there are new young people in the company and the students from the school who take part in the production too. They're, it's their first time and there will be people in the audience who are having their first experience of it. Well, we look forward to it. Thank you very much for talking to it. Is there a moment when you're sitting there and you, and you would like to be back in it? Or now are you like, no, I've done my work, I'm, uh, you know... It... We're realistic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Round of applause for Christopher, for Monica, and for Kevin as well. Thank you. So uh, tonight's insight is being watched by people around the world. I've heard talk that you're watching in America, you're watching in Portugal, you're watching in France, you're watching in Mexico. Hello and welcome to all of you. And don't forget you can tweet us. We'd love to hear what you think this evening. And we do as well have a digital program for The Sleeping Beauty. It's available free on our website to all of you. You need to go to roh.org.uk slash publications and then use this code. It's in capitals free beauty okay in capitals free beauty roh.org.uk slash publications now please welcome some dancers anna rose o'sullivan is over here and tierney heap with ballet mistress samantha rain round of applause for these guys right. <laughs> lucky wonderful so we've been talking all night obviously about the sleeping beauty but what makes it so special for you for me personally, it was the first ballet I saw as a child at the Royal Opera House. So it definitely played a huge role in inspiring me to want to become a professional. And it's just so beautiful and traditional and pure. So I think that's why it's special to me. And Tierney? Um, I think it's, it's a story that everyone knows and that everyone kind of gets into. The music is unbelievable. The costumes, the set. Um, it's classical ballet at its purest. Um, and it's a fairy tale. Everyone loves a fairy tale. 
And we were hearing about the physical demands of it. Do you really feel that? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really demanding. Well, we're going to put you through some of your paces now. Sam, what's going to happen? Um, what we're, we're about going to, to rehearse two of the fairy um, solos that happen in the prologue. Um, Tierney's Enchanted Garden and Anna Rose is the Songbird Fairy. So okay. we'll... And is this, earlier on, I was hearing that it's the first ever time they'd rehearsed. Is this the first time you've rehearsed? We've done one other rehearsal. Yeah, one. Right. Um, and uh, have either of you danced the role before? Nope, that's fine. So coming to it completely, you know, fresh, how, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I think just get stuck into it, <laughs> really, um, and enjoy it. Yeah. And we were hearing when you're dancing um, and you, you get into the mood of it and you get, you know, into maybe being in an angry mood or whatever, when you're being a fairy, well, what are you bringing to it? You know, how do you make yourself feel to dance the role? We're each bringing a gift, so I'm bringing uh, the gift of eloquence. I'm bringing the gift of vitality. To the baby Aurora, so whatever our solo is, we I just have passed to... you a mic on, sorry, thank you. Uh, we're each bringing gifts, I'm bringing eloquence, and Tierney is bringing... Vitality. Um, so we have to try to, you know, to show that through our dancing, we're giving that to the baby Aurora, so it's almost like a blessing to her. So you can't come on and be moody, <laughs> you have to, you have to show, yeah. yeah. And as we were seeing earlier, it's very much about the language as well, the expressing Absolutely. the language. Absolutely, and yeah. obviously getting the story across as well. Um, well, but I'll let you get on yeah, with it. I'll, I'll leave you to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, shall we start with you, Tony? <laughs> um, so let's do section by section, and then we see how we get on and try and run it later. So, Paul... If you pick up Tierney roughly when she's on centre and then she's going to burst forward. Yeah. Should we give it a go, Tierney? Yeah. You warm? So we'll just do the first step and see what happens. Thanks, Paul. Sorry. Ready? And not too quick. And charge forward. Take everyone in. And push that back leg forward on the bore. Good, better second side. Stop, Paul, thank you. Can we go a little bit under for just while we're working on it? Good. So really, as soon as you come on from the stage, even though Paul's picking you up later, really, yep. really get, take everyone in, take the whole auditorium in. Real presence. Don't, if, don't be, do quite such a big jump for you, because it's so huge, but really make sure we land over that front foot. Now we're going to use body and over, coupe, Again, Bore on that beat, get that and chase that front foot, um, back leg forward. So we're travelling up and down. And again, take everyone in on that Bore. Take, use your eyes, everything. And then we're going the same. Again, over with the body. Yeah, make sure we see this and don't get too high with this side arm. Yeah. Keep them in front of us, even though we're leaning over. Yeah, and then Bore. Then we go again. And really make sure we get to that passe, not too late. Yeah. Really get to the passe and hold. Coupe. Forward and forward. Two, three, four, and forward. Better. Now let's go into this next section. So we go again into the passes. Then remember what we were saying the other day. Really get yourself back. Con yes, yeah. contain yourself. Don't let yourself go back with your arms or anything over, if anything. Boom, in one movement, we really up on that leg so that you can go up, up, keep going. You're going back with this arm, Tierney. Keep this over. Keep, yeah, keep, really so we, you should be able to see it. Your fifth, don't let it get behind you. Keep your ribs in and use your core. Yeah. And out with the leg. Yeah, try and show this bum before we show the, the rond. Really establish where you need to be on that leg. And up, pull up on the supporting side. You're not quite over enough on your leg. Go further over than you, need to, than you think you need to to be able to hold. And pull up the back of your leg. Yes, better. Don't let this go. A little bit better. You're a little bit loose. Go As you do your rond, you're allowing your ribs and core to let go. Keep this in, over, and know where you're going to focus as well. 
whether it's down or whatever is going to help better. Yeah, I think that helps. Yeah, go long and over. More. Yeah, more over. Keep this, don't let this side lift, your right side. Keep this over all length, that whole supporting side. Your, your back, Tierney. As you lift, you're, you're going back with your ribs. Keep this, don't allow that to release. For, better, better. You see, even this for you needs to be more, a little bit more round and just a bit, yeah, in, over, ribs. Good. Shall we carry on? Yes. Into the limp. So we've done that and then we go limp. So the baby, really remember, the baby will be roughly about here and you're focusing at her, and we need this in, and the coup de pie, but the blessing is to her, and your arms need to be very contrasted and soft, soft. Don't turn your head too far so we lose you completely. Little inclined that way, so it's a bit of a cheat with body and hips, so we don't completely lose your face. Yeah? yeah? Should we do that much? And stop there. Go again and stop after the bless. It's a little bit under poor for now, thank you. Take everyone in. Over, over, over with your... Second leg in on the bore, chase. Over. Now pull up. Better, good. Up and down. Two, three, four, bless, six. Going forward and up. Good, very good, Tony. <laughs> the last turn. Oh, uh, could later. have a little moment, yeah. So you maybe can do one more, Shane. Yeah. If you want to try, <laughs> yeah. This one we can do a little bit softer still with keep your movement in your elbows and fingers. Really, really soft at that moment of focusing on the baby. Real, real blessing there. Um, good. And then really set yourself up ready for this diagonal so you know where you're going. You're a little bit high with your lame ducks. If you can keep this, look, when you go side, don't get above shoulder height. Keep this shoulder blades working. Press. Yep. Good. Should we go into the last diagonal? Um, um, and really make that ending. Really, boom, boom. Really, that's what we'll all remember. Uh, into, the, uh, into the blessing, actually, into the limps. Shall we? Oh, okay. Yeah, is that okay, Paul? Eight in for that. Eight in, thank you. Bless. Two, three, four, five, smooth. Using the head and out and up. Keep going forward with your weight. Forward, forward. Step out. Now, use your head, spot, spot, spot. Better, good. Um, Tierney, be careful you don't lift your shoulders at the, into that fifth. Keep this pressed down as you lift your arm. Yeah, it's still a li little bit, especially your right one's lifting. Slightly pushed down. Boom, boom, and spot, focus again at the end. And cross, you can cross that fourth a little bit more if we can. Boom, yeah, focus. Don't be so, quite so flexed. Okay. Good. Very good. Should we do a bit of Songbird and then we'll go back and run at the end? Good. So, Paul, um, this is the one where she goes hello to King and Queen and then and for now, shall I give an and? Yeah, for example. Yeah. The normally gives a the so, it's a quite tricky moment tricky to catch, to go together. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Anna did your hello and oh, 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 oh. Okay, stop 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 there, thank you, thank you, Paul. Good, nearly, nearly caught it in the end. <laughs> um good to Anna, you need to be much more over with your weight. You said yesterday. Yeah, and fo start low, start low, start low, and focus, focus, run, run, and it lifts, and everything lifts. Your arms and heads are, are focused, and 
at the same time, and it's at the same time as doing this. Yeah, and then the run, you're a little bit early to coupe, yeah. tombo rather, into that double out. Really song, 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 fingers be by your mouth. Little bit, can we do more to this corner so we're not on fast? Yes, and, and then we need to do that and so we're on the right leg to go again. One, two, two, over more, arms in front of you, Anna. You're a little bit too side going up. Keep them over and in front. Over, 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 over. Good. Carry on. Da, 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 da. You're a little bit late then from... It's a really hard one for coordination. Um, from here, as we go over, we lift, 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 lift. We can still come down a little bit early, so we're already here, coupe. Da, 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 da. And over with your arms in front. More. Yes, less, yes, lift, lift, lift. Yes, better. Good, Anna. Da. Da, da, oh, da, da. Okay, make sure now, as we're doing this, we really push back, but see this attitude. And one, and a, da, attitude, attitude, and in. So it's for the first four attitudes. So we need to see the difference in this attitude and this back, and then the coup de pied. Yeah, and as much feet as we can in between, make sure we're in fifth, not fourth. Bore, fifth, bore. Da, 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 da. Okay, one sec. So, um, so from here again, don't let anything go side because we lose it. It should be over, bending as much body as we can. Then the arm can join a little bit as we go, and the diddle with the head, head, fingers, fingers, fingers the whole time. Yeah? yeah, and you're still a little bit. I'm not quite seeing the difference in the attitude. Just do an devon that. From here, make sure we really. Replace each foot each time. Uh, yes, a little bit better. You're still going to a baggy fifth. Da, 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 not too high with the attitude, Devon. Just needs to be for you longer, but don't need to lift so much. So we see this over in the body. Yeah. As much feet as you can. And one, and two, and down, and down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Good. So by this point, we will have probably got to about here. So probably quarter, not too high up, because we need to be quite far down for this next step. So then we're going again, Anna, it's just, the whole thing needs to be more forward and over. Forward as we go, lift, little, 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 little. Yes, 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 yes. And I think we really go from the mouth into that, that moment. Really sing to everyone. Yes, good. <laughs> Painful toes. Really go forward and then this last burrow back. We're going to go all the way down so we can lift, go all the way back and travel, travel, travel. Really dare, really dare, push back and uh, up. So at the very end, diddle, diddle, a bum. So we get the really on the music there. And back, diddle, 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 diddle. Yeah, don't be quite so bouncy. Use this. Use this plie so we can really peek it up onto that leg. A bit more to everything with you, not quite over. Diddle, diddle, forward. Better. Yeah. Should we go again? Yeah. Um, so let's go from the top. Okay. Yeah? See how we do. Try and get to the end, and then we'll do turny through. So, hello. And three, forward, stay over. Good. Relax the knees. Don't get too straight. Down, and up. And a one, and a down, and a two, and up, down, up, down, up, down. Good. Come a bit flatter. Show the coup PA. And forward, over, over with the body. So a little bit more there. And down, and back. Dare to go back, 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 back. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Very good. Very good, Anna. You could have done a couple more of these coming forward. And a little bit of bush. Yeah. Good. Much better. We just need to get this over a little bit more still. Forward rather than sideways. And then focus, if we focus with the arms, it makes a big difference to the coordination as well. Good. Shall we do turny all the way through? Yeah, shall we go? In here. Um, going back to the other one. Thanks, Paul. Oh, and push forward. 
forward, take everyone in. Arms in front, don't go back. Pull up and bless, oh careful, bless. Calm. Okay, slippy patch. Good, very good. Very good. This much is just put, keeping that extra pull up, getting yourself knowing where you're going to be. Have that moment of phew, calm. You're still going back a little bit. We'll work on that. Keep your ri every better. Good. Anna Rose, shall we do it one more time? And two, and over, 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 over. And oh, and oh, and keep, keep forward with the arms. Down and up, and one. And the attitude, cross the attitude of one. Down, up, down with the body. Good. Good, nice. And, and. Now keep going. And over, 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 over. Push forward, singing, and back. Good, it's for a second very much. rehearsal. It was, it was really wonderful. Crazy. Another round of applause there for Anna Rose Tierney and Sam. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't forget, you can catch The Sleeping Beauty live in cinemas worldwide. It's on the 28th of February. Find all the details on our website. It's roh.org.uk slash cinema. So thank you very much to all the dancers tonight. Tierney Heap, Anna Rose O'Sullivan, Olivia Cowley and Kristen McNally. Round of applause for our dancers. Thanks, of course, to Samantha Rain as well, to Monica Mason, Kevin O'Hare, Christopher Newton, Jenny Bavage and Paul Stobart doing a fine job over there on piano this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> And of course, we saw our Royal Opera House collections team. They joined us with those beautiful costumes. Thanks to our wonderful audience here at the Royal Opera House and to you watching wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night.